Yeah, All right. right. Today's uh, February 13th, 2017. And I'm uh, in the home of Robert Shrewsbury, who has done an amazing amount of research on uh, uh, giants. And uh, I just let, let him go from there and let him talk about it. Go, you're on. Robert, hit it. All right. Well, I uh, became interested in giants when I was about seven or eight years old. Because I grew up mostly in southern Utah in the Kanab area, especially through elementary school time. And uh, at that time, Kanab had a, a giant that was about 12 feet tall on display for people to come by and look at. Really? Mm hmm. And I saw him, and other people saw him. And most of the old timers in Kanab to this day remember that, the ones that are still alive. And they're usually a few years older than me. I'll be 67. In a few days. So, so that's interesting to me because, you know, when I first heard the story of Brewer's Cave and talking about giants, mm -hmm. I thought it was a farce. I, th I thought, you know, there was no such thing because uh, the internet wasn't around then. You know, yeah. it wasn't until I used to sell metal detectors and rent prospect. It wasn't till a Mexican guy got brought me an article of, of them finding a giant. Um, in Mexico that I thought, man, this is real. And then I found a book that talked about them, but it wasn't widely known about. For, so for you to know at that age, you know, that's it amazing It was early to me. on, yeah, it was. Well, you know, Kanab at the time, there was a lot of us, and we were not the only ones. Uh, my older brother spent a lot of time in the fields and the hills hunting and digging and getting arrowheads and beads and maven ducks and burials. And they would sell them to the tourists, and a lot of Kanab did that. Yeah, it probably started with Freddie Crystal, who came to Kanab with a map and hunting for Montezuma's treasure from Mexico. Half of Kanab at one time were out there digging in the hills, so that kind of set the pace. And yeah. then, so we did, and a couple of my older siblings uh, was at one of the canyons there, my Kanab. This was in the fifties, and right out on the open ground, they found two skeletons that were about twelve feet tall. Really? Mm -hmm. And they looked at him really close, and even though they were teenagers, they weren't uh, adults yet, they understood a little bit about uh, uh, bones and how your skull bones will fuse when, you, when you're an adult, and, and their skull bones, they noticed, were fused. And the reason they were curious is because in both cases with those, with those skeletons, they had another set of teeth in here underneath the first set growing out, hmm. which was really peculiar because we, we'd never... We didn't have any understanding about that particular thing. But anyway, they ended up just leaving them there and looking for stuff and left. And uh, many years later, I went back when I learned how to do a lot of detection work for tunnels and underground novelties and, and minerals and stuff like that. And I run a pretty good scan through there. And there's a very, very large tunnel that goes way back into the mountain there. I, I suspect somebody probably cleaned that out and removed the bodies and... Because for one, for a long time, there were rumors that some people out of Kanab found a treasure in there that was some $40 million that they sold on the black market hmm. in the same canyon. So I think that was exploited, that particular burial. But, you know, we weren't, uh, certainly weren't the only ones that found stuff. Uh, Tyrone Dennett found some ancient burials up in the White Mountains out of Kanab and brought one of the skulls home. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but a lot of people... He was a school teacher in Kanab. The skull that he brought from a cave full of skeletons had a very well, perfectly made gold tooth in it. Hmm. Go figure who did that. I don't know. And another family that I grew up with and went to some years in school with there in Kanab found a giant about eight or ten miles out of Kanab, Utah, of Johnson Canyon. I had a forensic done on a parchment that came out of there, and a spectrograph reading on a piece of metal that came out there—a metal ball. Now I've I've I seen that metal ball. I've seen, those, I've seen the metal ball, and I, I'd like you to talk about that metal ball, but also talk about that fabric or whatever, you know. The fabric. Is but a, but but before you get to that, okay. I want to I want to stop you and back up to that gold tooth. That yeah. wasn't a normal skull. You're talking that was a giant. It was a skull of a skull. giant. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it was. a normal. It wasn't, it wasn't normal size. It was larger size. Okay. Yeah. But the giant was about was nine feet tall. My friend measured him. 
this was in the 50s, they had an archaeologist come out, an, anth an anthropologist, and they looked at the, skull, the bones really well, and they says, this guy is Negro. Huh. Oh, and I thought, wow, because so many of the people that are found in Utah that are giants are quite often redheaded and light-skinned people, but this guy was not. Wow. I mean, we don't know what color hair he had, but his bones were negroid, according to the, the authorities at that time that looked at it. You know, it was pretty common for people to dig a lot of burials in those days, and it wasn't policed or controlled. Right. So uh, most stuff like that is found uh, usually after a heavy rainstorm and a lot of flooding. Or it's also found uh, farmers will be digging and building things and making ditches and removing a lot of dirt. And a lot of it's found by accident. But the truth is where giant burials are at, there's a certain geological relationship to where they're buried. Really? I'm not going to tell it. Okay. I don't want that found out. Okay. There's about four different styles. And not everything that's dug up is a giant from ancient times here in Utah. Hmm. I want people to understand that. There's a bunch of people up a canyon where that nine-foot Negro was buried. And if you go to the end of that canyon, there's these big spirals carved in stone. I mean, they are massive, and they go down into the, into the, into, through the sandstone into other burials. Those people in there are only about six feet tall, all the way down to babies. And they are redheaded, but they're not giants. Hmm. But they're definitely from an ancient civilization. They're not modern burials. Right. So go figure. I can't tell anybody who would. My take on that is not religious on any of the burials. Mm -hmm. My thing is I like to know who they are, where they came from, and what kind of people they were. And that's the same as me. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <I've> researched. <laughs> that's the I same as me. Who? Religionists have their own. One, one, are they real? And two, if they are, who were they? I agree. You know, religionists have their take on it, and that's fine. I can appreciate their thoughts on it. Yep. But I don't really have a, any preconceived notions or thoughts on who they might be and who they should be. There's one area where I saw two calendars, and I looked at it really close, and I would swear it's probably the Tzolkan calendar that came from South Central America from the Toltec. Hmm. I can't tell you what it's doing on Johnson Canyon, but that's also on Johnson Canyon. Well, yeah. there's a lot we don't know. Yeah. You know, so. uh, and when that got me started, and I was curious, I was always been a curious person, and when I study something, I usually do it like a cloistered monk. I stay with it, and I've been with it all of my life, since I was about eight years old. So there's books like The Conquest of Mexico and Peru by Prescott. It was taken from an older book that Lord Kingsborough wrote when he was in Central America and South America during the conquest of Mexico and Peru. And... The book's about a thousand pages of fine print, and there's some, one place in there they talked about how the Spanish captured some giants and put them in cages and tried to take them back to Spain. Hmm. So early on it was understood that those people did exist, but they died on the boat and were not alive when they made it back to Spain. I think they ended up throwing them overboard or something like that. And so I said, that's a lot on that too. And, but also, as far as giants and ancient burials are concerned, from what I've seen, just from the pattern, you know, there's a lot of places I've seen. I've looked in a lot of stuff. Uh, Johnny Brewer was a friend of mine from the time I was 26 years old. I spent a lot of time with him. I have stacks of letters from John. John Brewer, and that's talking about John Brewer. the Brewer Cave mm -hmm. and, and the giants he found in the ancient records. So I just wanted everybody to know that. Okay. Exactly, like John Brewer. And uh, what he found, a lot of people have the concept of that's the only one, that's all there is. But I'm here to tell you, there's not two or three of them buried here and there. There's not two or three hundred of them. There are thousands of them buried at large in Utah. Some of them in Idaho, some of them in Arizona. Uh, the really, it appears to me from my observations, I've seen a lot of them, it's almost like there's a pecking order. If somebody's really important, and they'll be decorated in all kinds of jewels and metal, precious metals, and they will be buried much deeper and much harder to get. Where some of the ones that are in shallow graves, there's usually nothing on them metallic. And they're usually accessible. Whereas the, the one like Johnny Brewer, John told me that one time he took about 40 feet deep to get to the first entrance. And it's been my observation that 
the really important ones important because they have a lot of metal on them and they have records and stuff like that are buried very, very deep. But I also know that from being a professional at uh, electronic equipment that can find underground things, I'm here to tell you that 90% of the caves or more are not visible. Because we have geology and we have erosion and these valley floors were deeper at one time. And over eons of time, with erosion, they build up higher and higher and higher. And when I first started shooting signals into the ground, I found out that the base of mountains were packed with caves. Hmm. As far as I know, the, cave, the, the giants were spent a lot were cave dwellers. And their caves are covered up in, for the most part. So if you can find one, you'll likely find it somewhere between 30 and 40 feet deep. At, from the base of a mountain. Uh, the one that my friend Bruce dug up was a nine-footer up Johnson Canyon. He used a bulldozer and a backhoe. That guy was 35 feet deep. That's pretty deep. So so you've, you've physically seen some of these giants. You, you, I have, yeah. Okay. I have. I don't dare do any excavation. Uh, it's not lawful. A guy could go to jail for a long time. Uh, I've tried a few times to get people to put up the funding, and then I, if they would, I would take them there. And we could do a lawful overboard excavation. We could have an archaeologist there, certified anthropologist. I know it's one of your things that you want to get a DNA sample yeah, of, a DNA. of one of these guys to see who they are. That's exactly what I'd like to do. And uh, according to John Brewer, he told me unequivocally, and he, and he told, me, told me the same thing at different times, and I believe him. He says he took a hair sample from the giants that he found, and BYU had agreed to do an atomic absorption and do some analysis of the hair. He says they would never give him the results of it. Mm. He says he found out the results, of it, at least a little bit about them, from a friend of his on the inside of BYU, who quietly let him know that it was the healthiest specimen ever analyzed. Mm. So, how I can't document that, I can't prove it, but right. I, I know John and knew him quite well. Anyway, his cave, and people refer to his cave, but John Brewer told me repeatedly that the map inside the cave shows seven other caves. In the San Pete Valley? In San Pete Valley. He, he, st he took me to two other different places where the caves were. One of them was over by Spring City. And there's some more over on the west side of here. So mm -hmm. Pretty good stuff there. And there's other stories with other people that have been over there and run across stuff too that were pretty interesting. So there's quite a few of them. And there's a lot of things in common, you know, like Johnny Brewer's Cave, according to John, and, and, the, and the cave that I went into. And, and, and that, in both cases, there's some pretty good looking, really nice crystal balls. Hmm. They're solid, they're not hollow. And they're made out of beryllium. Hmm. Now I just want to, I'm bringing that up for a reason because I found a parallel between what Johnny found in his cave and what I've seen in the cave with the lost books of the Bible. When you read the Exodus and the Pseudepigrapha by Charles Worth, where the Hebrews were in the promised land and they had to war with a race of people known as the Amorites. And according to that text, they were giants, and they were large enough to where Joshua and his warriors had to cut them at the waist because they couldn't reach their head hmm. at all. And after that war went on and they subdued them, Joshua says he took a lot of their sacred things out of their temples underground, and that some of them were crystal balls. Hmm. I just find it interesting that there you have giants and you have crystal balls, and Johnny Brewer has giants and crystal balls, and they're continents apart, and those two things would come together. Hmm. And that's uh, something I wanted to mention. Yeah, interesting. So, as far as Johnny, Johnny Brewer's cave right now, as far as I know, it's been uh, demolated. The entrance has been blown in. Mm -hmm. so, and it's uh, in an area where if you, if you try to get in at your home, you're visible. Yep. 
So in its uh, the, when you get through the legal ramifications and all the red tape of the bureaucracy has has put on the people. Now I agree that people should not desecrate burials, mm -hmm. and they should it should never be a free for all, and it should never be done for people private collections. Right. It wouldn't offend me personally if. Uh, some of those burials were exhumed for study and for research. I mean, the one they had a big fight with Ken Kenowick Man and, 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 and shared with with the public. You shared know? with the public because because you really right, need to know. So right, right, right now, you know, it, it's said that it's being suppressed. You know, um, the the knowledge of of, of giants or or, or uh, and, and that type of stuff. And 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 my question is, why would they care about the that giants being the, suppressed? Why would they even care? You know, so I would like to, I would like to see just to see if they are real or not, or if this is all made up, or if this is real. But you've said you've seen them, so I know what I've seen. Yeah, and, uh, I've got the same question. It's my biggest question, not my biggest, but it's right at the top. Who's hiding it and why? Why isn't there? Why has there not been an open board excavation so we, John Q. Public, can see and know and understand the truth? And I would really like to know that. You know, I know another guy in, in southern Utah, and I'm not going to mention his name, and I know him quite well. He asked me to come and work on his property and help him excavate some more sites because he found some. He looked in there, and they were giants. He talked to BYU about it, and they asked for permission to go look at it, and he gave him permission. And then he left town for three days, and the time he got back, they had taken 14 bodies. Wow. He swears by it. Huh. I can't prove it. Right. But if that's the case, and if he's telling the truth, then what, what is really going on? You know what? I know what I saw. And I challenge anybody for an overboard excavation with permits, and I will take them there if they want to excavate one. But I want it. The first it, thing I want to happen is I want it videoed. Yes. So and I want that. something there with size. Put a yardstick in there so we can see the relative size. Right. Uh, National Geographic magazine sitting there or something like yeah. that. Or the Ancient American magazine. So we can see, and you stand in there or whoever they are, we, we know the known size. So so thing. is is one of these sites on private property? I know where the, the sites are on private property. Because yes. on private property, we have a better chance of excavating than getting our archaeologists in there. And I've got a better one than that. Okay, that's it. I have a friend that has them on private property, and he's gave he's given me permission to do it. Okay, and it's waiting. It's been waiting for years and years and years. You know, I was gonna get permission from some private property down south where that nine footer was buried, that nine foot giant. And uh, the people that dug him up sold the property, so they don't own it anymore. Right. So Wayne May at the Ancient America asked me if he says, "Hey, uh, would you please go see if you can get permission from them to dig it up and take pictures of it and do it and do an esca, you know, an overboard excavation?" And I said, "Sure." So he sent me some gas money, I guess. <laughs> and so I went down there and I talked. I couldn't get the owner, but I talked to the foreman, and he just says, "No way, under any condition whatsoever, would I ever allow this hmm. be excavated." And I never got the owner. The owner lives in Vegas, and there's about 15 people with his name, so I couldn't follow yeah. up on that. But uh, I never told them where it was buried at. I just told them on their property. I figured that they wouldn't, you know, let it cooperate and why tell them anything. Right. You know, take a chance on somebody moving in yeah. or something like that. But he's still there. You know that. And so anyway, that's, uh, so yeah, that's why, that's why I stand in offer. And uh, anybody wants to do it. So, so, yeah, I think we would like to do something with along that lines and waiting for um, our scientist to get back so he can do the the uh, DNA samples and stuff like that. and uh, On and day one, we leave. I can take him to a spot where you can see the tombs on the surface of the ground and the spiral tombs carved down. Hmm. I had a lot of photographs of those that I took a few years ago. And I had a virus in my computer and I had to record Terrible. that. Terrible. And I have one left. Terrible. <laughs> I could probably get them if I emailed the people I sent them to. It would be work, but I could get yeah. them. But it, it can all be redone. I mean, it's not too hard to get. And, and one of the sites is about it's less than 10 miles from here where I got permission. Hmm. So it's not very far away. So yeah. I'd be glad to do it. And he's a nice guy. He's amiable. He says, uh, but I, I warn you, that particular burial probably is 40 feet deep. So you're going to have to have, it's going to be work getting. Right. And, and there's a lot of metal there. 
I detected that with my EM83 and my resistivity. That's all it is. You know, it's not a metal iron. So it's, it would be a wonderful, wonderful place to do it, you know. So anyway. So, so yeah, I think, you know, we would get be interested, the Ancient Historical Research Foundation. As soon as our scientist gets back, you know, we'd like to, just like you said, we want it videoed um, and, and released to the public so it's documented. And then, and like you said, uh, things have got to be there to show size, a yard, stip, or whatever. Um, I'd like our scientists, our archaeologists there so that everything's on the up and up. In, in everything's up and up overboard, yep. exactly. Okay. Yep. Can you turn that off for a minute? Yeah. Okay, and you're back on. All right, Terry, you asked about the metal ball that was found on that giant in southern Utah. Uh huh. That metal ball weighs, it's, it's mostly round, but it's not exactly round. It's metallic, and it uh, weighs 32 grams about. I had an X-ray fluorescent done on it. And it uh, it's made out of plutonium, thorium, platinum, and gold, and americium. Hmm. It was in a little container about like that. I had the container analyzed, and it was mostly made out of boron. If you're a nuclear physicist, I don't know if you are. I'm not. <laughs> but a modulator inside of a nuclear reactor. They use boron because it slows down the neutrons, and they use beryllium it speeds it up, as I understand it. Hmm. Anyway, that was what was on that giant. It, was, it wasn't on the inside; it was on the outside of his body. So, so, and and it had a symbol carved. It was about the size of uh, what a quarter, only it was completely round like a marble. It was, yeah. Maybe a little bit bigger than a quarter, maybe a 50 cent piece, but it was round like a marble. It was real dense, it was real heavy, and a symbol. And there was a symbol on it. Yes and no. It could be a symbol, it could be natural. I don't know. It was one of those symbols you couldn't quite tell. From what I looked at it really close. Uh huh. And then that, that was there in that, in that particular burial. When we were children, uh, my older brothers found those similar balls, the same color. They have like a. It's almost like an orange peel on the outside and a patina. And one of my brothers found four of them in a very ancient burial. And he tried to cut it with a hacksaw, it wouldn't cut. And he tried to drill it and it wouldn't drill. So he finally put it on an anvil and hit it with a sledgehammer and it did break open. Hmm. And it was non metallic. I mean, it was not, it was no, it's non ferric, I mean, excuse me. And the magnet wouldn't touch it. If you look at it, when, it, when it, as we broke it open, it split in half. It was really like a grainy metal. Hmm. It was mostly silver looking, with just a tint of gold color. And but all the lines, like little grains, came from the center out. Hmm. It was a peculiar, you know, piece of metal. I don't know whatever happened to those. That particular brother's dead now, and stuff. Who knows? You know. Yeah. But that was uh, yeah, very peculiar. So then, and then I know that there was some uh, um, something made like a fishnet, or or there was a very good fishnet there. It was made so good you would almost think it was made in modern times with a machine. Hmm. It came out of the same burial that the uh, parchment that had a very complex weave in it that, that Frank Aon in Santa Fe, New Mexico, did a forensic on. It's, it's uh, probably camel's hair. So it came back Camel's Hair, and that's here found in Kanab. Mm -hmm. Outside of Kanab of Johnson Canyon. Did he do a date on that? You know, not on that. He did do a date on the on the little lead brewer plate that I have. So, so yeah, and I know he did that. How did he get a date on, a, on, on, on metal, you know? There has to be some kind of organic matter, matter left on it. Okay. So, and... Um, there was four of those little round discs, of course, and then four rectangles that came out of that particular place. And uh, John just kind of, he passed one to me, and he passed one to somebody else, and somebody else. He even passed one to the famous, well-known, now-deceased treasure hunter that was known as Apache Jim. Hmm. He's Now, John, Apache Jim's dead, so I don't know where that plate is. Yeah. You know, so. Jim Wilson was his really name. I actually met Jim Wilson. When I was about that age in Southern Utah in elementary school, I didn't know who he was at the time. 
But he spent some time in southern Utah looking for the Aztec treasure. So that's kind of interesting. So I remember you telling me a long time ago about uh, somebody told you about a uh, a giant in a crystal coffin in southern Utah somewhere. Tell well, me that story. he was. Um, Tell me that story. He was a sheep herder, and he spent a lot of time out in the field, and he found a cave in the Blanding area that had some crystal coffins in it. And he says, you could see right through them, just like glass. And he says, the people on there were so preserved, they looked like they took, they were sleeping. And uh, he was a very interesting fellow. I don't know where he's at right now, but you know, there's a lot of those. There's a, there's a place in Utah around um, in the Henry's. I won't say where, of course. Right. And the Navajos uh, were trusted to guard that place. It's underground. And they said it was the library of the world. Hmm. Uh, they had a big fight with the Spanish and killed a lot of them to keep them out of there because the Spanish were trying to exploit that. I know some of the players involved in that. And some of them are, I don't think that the last keeper is still alive, but I don't know. Right. Uh, that place covers, I've spent some time up there. It's a, basically a hollow cavity underneath the ground that would probably cover maybe four by 5,000 feet. That's how much hollow is there. Hmm. So it's a very large place. I've never been into that place, but I've done my, my detection work on it and, and know where it's at. That's another thing that someday if, if, uh, if people are ready for that, and my opinion is, if they will do fair and just and true and right on a small find and be overboard with it, and then another one or two, and if this stuff comes out in the open, then maybe someday people will be privy and ready for greater knowledge. That's my feeling on that. Yeah. You know, I would never take anybody right. there because it would be, what's the point? You know what I mean? Probably be looted or something like that. I spent a lot of time in the field with a lot of people. You know, uh, The best sources of information that I have ever found as far as people that know and people have knowledge, is farmers, ranchers, and people that are elders. And when I was a little kid, I talked to them and I listened to them. I loved their stories. And so, they so, me. so, yeah, talk about your connection with, with, the, sure. with the Native American people and, and the, the, the down in South America, Central America, all, all that. You've okay. got to... uh, some of my ancestors are, are Native American, uh, Delaware, and... Um, I have a lot of friends uh, among the Delaware people. I've worked with them for about 10 years on solid, and I really enjoyed them. You know, talk about burials and being taboo to dig up a dead person. The Delaware people, you know, you can't, I'm saying you can't stereotype an Indian the Native American people. Right. Because some of them are as different from one another, some tribes as the Italians are from the French. Yeah. Or from the English, and not the same. And, and the Delaware, basically, when they had to migrate or travel, they would dig up their father and their grandfather and their great grandfather and dig him up, take him with them, take him with them, and rebury him close huh? to their village. Hmm. So it's not taboo to dig up a, a, a human remains with some tribes, and then other tribes buried their dead in trees. So, but anyway, on that, yeah. So a lot of my native people and then. I, I, I worked a lot with the Navajo to get uh, Peter McDonald to pardon, which he finally did get. And so I worked really close with a lot of them and with Peter McDonald's wife. And, and I wrote letters uh, to so many people <laughs> asking them to help. I even wrote to the Prince of Wales and got a, got a note back. So I for, said, for, for what did you write? The Prince regarding Wells, the Peter McDonald. You know, I felt like he got a bad deal. I felt like he got a raw deal. So I say I worked a lot with my native people. And I have a lot of good friends among them, and the Navajo, and the Ute, and the Paiute. My mother was born on the Kaiba Paiute Reservation. And I know a lot of those people there. I lived there for a few years at one time in my life. And, you know, in 1913, according to the elders, there was a red-headed giant that lived up by Wolf Springs. He lived there. He lived in a cave. And by 1913, he, he visited them, including the Shivwits down in St. George. He says, look, I'm old, I'm ready to die. He says, I'm going to my burial. So he kind of partied with them. And, and so then he went to Mount Trumbull. 
and that's his burial somewhere in Mount Trumbull. What's interesting is that Gordon Smith found a burial at Mount Trumbull in an ice cave, according to him. And that's a long, long, long story. I don't think we really want to tell it here. So he found a lot of gems and a lot of stuff there in that burial. And, uh, so this, uh, but the last one to be seen alive, as far as I know, is 2013. Uh, excuse me, 1913. So that's just a little over and, and that's years just, ago. That's that's uh, um, just um, oral history from from the from the from tribal the, from people, the tribal people mm -hmm. there and. Exactly. There was a real interesting book called Indian Joe that was written 40, 50 years ago. And that's out of publication. And it was, it was about a medicine man, a youth medicine man. And I knew his grandson who gave me a zero copy of the book. And that's a real interesting book to understand some of the oral history and traditions of the tribal people that were here and that knew at the time. So a lot of the stuff I have seen personally, places I've been to, is also in their history. Hmm. So they were they they knew and they understood at large what was here and what was around here and what they were dealing with, but the giants, there's still a mystery as far as anything over there. I long from the day when we can bring something out. Behind me to the south, about two or three miles, is Parley's Parley's Lake. It looks like a pond to me, but there's quite a bit of water there. And, and, uh, Anyway, I was talking to a, an old farmer friend of mine that's probably in his middle eighties, Ken Larson, and he got a little farm over there. And I was talking to him about giants and tall people and stuff, and and how they were, you know, about the Johnny Brewer cave. And he says, "Well, I know where something like that is." And I said, "Where?" And he says, "Well, over by Party's Lake on the bank on the west side." He said, "There's an irrigation ditch that comes around there, on that mountain." And he says, "When I was..." He said when he was nine years old, his father took him there, and there was a, it started out as a tunnel that went down about a 33rd degree angle, and it went into some carved out stone steps that went into a big square room there. And his, his father took him down in there. There was nothing there, but there was another tunnel that was backfilled. Mm. So apparently it had been stripped of whatever was in there. So anyway, Ken Larson took me right over there and showed me where it was at, and I photographed it, and then later I took... Uh, Utana, Shemin Utana, out there, and she photographed it. But uh, Ken had told the owner of what was there, and so the only one over there, and he had uh, had somebody dig trying to, because that was all caved in. And I, we saw that it was like a big shaft that went down, and you could see where the shore had busted. So I went ahead and talked to the owner, and I explained to him. I says that target, you go down that shaft that goes inward towards the lake. And if you dig that out, you may rupture that body of water and you'll flood this whole valley and we won't have any irrigation anymore. <laughs> it's right by the golf course. So but anyway, that whole area that starts about Manti, close to where the temple is, all the way up to Six Mile Canyon, according to Isaac Morley. And, and uh, he's, a, he's a very interesting fellow. Isaac Morley says that whole area is covered with burials. Now he was a he was a, a, a an old time pioneer. Yeah, he, he was, he was pioneer. one of the founders of, of Manti here, or he was the yes, he was a well known elder in the LDS Church, and uh, he still has an old house that he lived in that's still still standing, although he's been gone for a lot of years. Morley was the first person that Brigham Young and Chief Walker picked to go to the ancient mine where they got their gold, which really helped the Mormon Church out a lot. After he got too old to do it, it was then that Rhodes was picked. Ah, so Most Rhodes wasn't, know. I didn't know that. It wasn't, I knew Morley was tied in there somehow, but I didn't know he was He first. was, he was the first one, and finally Brigham Young told him, he said, you got to go, and he says, I can go one more time. He says, I'm too old and feeble. He says, I can't do it again. So he went one more time, and then they worked it out with Chief Walker, and they picked uh, Rhodes to do that work. But he, Morley knew an awfully lot, and he says, this valley, right, this valley, right, about the temple, all the way to Six Mile Canyon. All the, and it is, it's the whole thing's packed with burials. I've shot a lot of signals there. It might be as many as a hundred. No, not that many. There are probably several hundred burials. Some of them will be multiple burials inside of tunnels. Mm. The whole area is packed. So, so he says, oh, well, I think of how the Brewer, the Brewer Cave, how do you know it's the Brewer Cave? There's a lot of them there. Yeah, a lot of them are shallow burials, and they're not complex, and they're not in a sepulcher like the like the two mummies that John Brewer found. Now, I'll grant you that, but there's a lot of them there. So. Anyway, um, anything else? 
that's another interesting one because there was one found in Utah similar where there was giants in it. And this is now I'm on the tra I was on the treasure line. I saw signals for people for a lot of years. I right. heard a lot of stories, but I can never say who went. Right, 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 right. And so, uh, but th that's come out here in Utah too. People that have found giants in caves with Spanish stuff. Really, and smolten smelted bars and stuff like that. Actually, Johnny Brewer's cave has this one. Close has a set of Spanish armor in it. Well, I know that Brewer's Cave, you know, he found some armor out west and then brought it and put it in his cave yeah. east. Basically, when you find, if you find a giant burial, that's one of the really important ones, you'll find multiple giants in there that are buried, and you'll find they're, they're all in sarcophaguses, and they're all covered with jewels and ornaments that are made out of gold mm. and silver. And a lot of beryllium, like uh, emerald type of gem, but... My signaling, if I find a, I found a lot of those places, you know, I have a little mini well rig that'll do 100 feet that is demountable, and I can take a barrel of water and fit that over anything and drill a hole down with a little bit like that, a little diamond bit, and, and I can drop a look to camera down and video what's in there without ever, you know, that's I, I used that a lot when I was doing a lot of blind tests and seeing what I could do. Yeah. Where I could find out, you know, reasonably fast what I actually had underground. And, uh, so there's a lot of burials like that, but when the Spanish exploited them, quite often they would they would strip everything off the bodies and then separate the silver from the gold. They would be a pile of silver inside the tomb, pile of gold, pile of silver, pile of gold, intermittently sometimes for 500 feet. Huh. And I can tell with my signaling whether it's been exploited by the Spanish or not, because if it hadn't been exploited by the Spanish, all of the gold and silver will be detected together yeah. in every part of that tunnel. Huh. But if the Spanish has hit it, you'll detect a pile of silver, and then you'll detect a pile of gold some footage away, and then you'll detect another. So the pattern, you can pretty well tell. And of course, there's almost always Spanish symbols and stuff in an area where the Spanish yeah. been. I know where probably a dozen tunnels are that the Spanish have exploited already. You know, that, uh, I've never uh, taken anything out of those places or anything like that. But be interesting to find one on private property. What What's your take on why do you think the the giants have been covered up? You got a theory or a, <sighs> a, a take on that, or part of it's natural because in most cases their burials are much deeper. And they're in caves. And remember when I was talking about the, the base of the mountain raising because of erosion over yeah. eons of time? So if there's a cave that was in there, like say 4,000 years ago, and they, they dug down and then in for the cave and then buried it up, and then four or 5,000 years later, the silt in the bottom of the valley floor is just mm -hmm. up and up and up and up and up. So they're, they're much harder. So you have flooding and stuff like that. And on rare occasions, it does uncover a burial like that. But not very often. Yeah. You now there was a flood in southern Utah this year that was so bad that I went to my property down there. I have some acreage outside of Canab. And I have this big gate. You know, I could walk underneath that gate and my head wouldn't touch it. Really? That's how much erosion I got on that property. Wow. And it's all over. Canab got flooded. So those are prime opportunities to go out and look for things when you've had serious yeah. erosion. But uh, the real, really good, good stuff is very, 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 I'm, I'm talking about 30 to 40 feet deep. So they don't very often be found accidentally. So that's a natural, that's part of nature. So, so why do you think that they've been found, you know, they was being found in the, in the 1800s and there's none being found now? I, I, my, my thought is, is probably because back then there was more people digging in mounds. There checking. were a lot more people out in the bush. Digging now, now. In the country. I wouldn't say a more, but on one hand, we have a lot of hunters that go out. But because of um, legal ramifications and, and uh, all the laws regulating treasures and treasure finding and ancient antiquities, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't have them, but there's a lot of countries like England, if you find something valuable by law, it's your half yours even if it's on private property right. and if the owner didn't know it. In Costa Rica, it's lawful if uh, but the country holds the first right to buy it from you at a fair price. But in, in in most places in the United States, if you find something, there's so many legal applications, most people. Will never say anything. Most people, are, I'm, I've been detecting for people for 20 something years. I know a lot of people, in my opinion, 
Most people melt it down and it hits the black market. If they would make it lawful and give some rice to the people, most of it would surface. These people, hard time, hard economy, some of them are desperate, they're hunting, and you can't outlaw people going out in the country. So I said, if they would have better laws, most stuff would surface. And uh, I, it's kind of like agree, refining, yeah. you know. Uh, I was in that business, and we dealt with a lot of miners and stuff like that. And, and the truth is, you, know, you read about this mine, oh, uh, 250,000 ounces came out of it, and that's not true. A lot more than that came out, huh? <laughs> they refine that stuff, and they hide it away, the raw material, and they declare so much. It's like a guy goes to buy a motel, and... And he has the records for the IRS, and he has the records for the guy that's buying it. Think about it. Yeah. It's not true. It's true, true, true. That's how true it is. Yeah. So you can't, there's a lot of data and a lot of information. You're just not going to get It's like that mine up in Montana where, you know, the capital is the capital now. It's called, these, these, these miners in the 1800s found this gold, and it was so much gold in it. that people moved in there from everywhere. It made 50 Millionaires back in the 1800s when money was worth something at the tune of over a billion dollars or three billion dollars, but That's not actually accurate Double that hmm. now you probably have an accurate. Answer. Yeah, it's human nature. You're right. not going to change human nature with legislation, right? You're going to scare a few people put a few people in prison But when you do that even the Native American repatriate Jack I understand how that and I feel for that But I wouldn't want somebody digging up my dad and my right. mom, I, agree. Know, I understand that but at the same yeah. time What it does is it protects 99% of the giant burials from being excavated so the government got what they want if They're hiding it and if they don't want people to know by using the Native American repatriation act it does more to instruct science and knowledge and understanding of our ancient people than anything we could do. So I think a limited uh, certain amount of excavation, I mean, uh, forensic studies and stuff like that should be done on this ancient things. And, uh, that's my opinion. You know. So, But I deal with reality. You make it lawful. You have a reward, a small percentage. I'm not even sure if you had any rights on private property. I'd have to talk to an attorney about that. I'm not real sure. So. Well, at least on private property, you could dig, and then when you find something, you know, then, then as long as you've got your archaeologists, your scientists, you're there. You, you, you know, could video it. Video it, exactly. release it to the public. Yep. I'm game. All right, amigo. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be hearing more then. For sure. <laughs> okay. Hi, Terry. Now, now I, I also know, Robert, that you've spent a lot of time researching, studying, and, and, and with physics, with all kinds of things, uh, trying to find uh, ways to find some of these burials, uh, uh, dealing with some things like that. And I know that, uh, you know, maybe I might be needing to, needing to, to, to have you helping me um, find some of this stuff, and, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, or if it's a secret, or if it's oh, a... Terry, I don't mind talking about that. I'm not going to uh, build a machine for somebody that said, here it is, this is what you do, and this right. is how it works, right. and I haven't even patented it yet. Yeah, so well, I'm and, not and, and, and I know you've got me. a lot of stuff. Yeah. You, you know, you've got the EM83s, you've got, you've got the, I mean, you've got all kinds of equipment for, you know, your right. research, what you've been working on, your... I do. I actually worked as a precious metals refiner for a number of years. And here in Manti, I built an assay laboratory and did assays for people for precious metals. I had that thing open for about five years, and then the, the acid and the chemistry was so intense for my age and health, I finally let it go. Yeah. Half of the reason I built the laboratory wasn't just to do assay work. That was to fund my research on detection. Right. And I've learned a lot about detection. I studied a lot of machines. I've tested a lot of machines. I finally built a machine that was better than anything that could be bought. But it took a lot of years and a lot of research to be able to detect. With this particular machine that I have now, I can shoot a signal underground. I did an oil well for a guy out of Switzerland and found his oil for him. And it was 6,500 feet deep. Hmm. So the distance, at least up to that much, wasn't really a problem, but I did detect some of the 
some of the gas and and, uh, and, and, a, and a lot of them in that particular place it was a thorium belt underneath it and then, which was it, was it was a difficult job but I can detect something and I can I can discriminate against and tell you what what particular type of metal it is I can get the approximate weight and I did some ore for a guy one time because he wanted me to assay it and and I told him, well, I told him, I said, Bob, I said, I closed my, my, my assay laboratory and I can't do that anymore. But I have a machine that could measure within 90% accurate of how much gold is in that particular ore, provided you get me one ton of it. So it'd be like a one ton assay so I can find out how many ounces or yeah. grams per ton. So he did that. And uh, I looked at that and I tested it and I said, you have between 48 and 50 ounces per ton. Hmm. It was a high grade that he got. Somewhere. That is a high, high, high grade. Really, really high. <laughs> That's a real high grade. So anyway, he took it back to the guy, and the guy says, well, I'm going to talk to the owner of that mine in a few weeks, and I want to look at his assays, which he did. And it came back that I was there was between 48 and 50 ounces. So that particular one was just right on the money. And I did that strictly electronically. Hmm. So, and if it had been platinum, I would have done the same thing. I could have done the same thing or... Rare earth metals, it really doesn't matter, but that particular machine, I keep it proprietary and yeah. keep it, you know, so if there's something someplace that needs to be found, I can find it, uh, be it bones or any kind of metal. Of course, calcium, most people don't realize it, but calcium is metal. It's metal? It is. It's uh, If you ever purify calcium and you look at it, it looks like a piece of aluminum. Huh. Our bones are not pure calcium. Calcium and magnesium, but of course, magnesium is also can be in the metallic state too. Yeah, but anyway, so I can detect bones. Um, I've detected a number of woolly mammoths, people, people hmm. want to know where they were at, and tunnels and water supplies, and stuff like that. So that's not a problem. So, so, so I know that you used to, I don't know if you still do or not, but you used to go out and and, and help. Find things for treasure hunters, like you say, the assets. Oh, do you that, still yes. do you still do that stuff? And I haven't done that for quite a long time because I don't advertise and I don't have a website. And nine out of ten people are tire thumpers and they're dreamers, and they all say, "Well, I'll give you on a consignment." And well, first off, I'm looking at the legality and I'm looking at where it's at and all the ramifications, and, and you know, it takes a lot of funding to really get involved. There was one I was going to do uh, that I. Down in southern Utah, and I looked at it. I said, "You can't touch this." And he says, "Why?" And I says, "It's on a national endangered species reserve, uh -huh. and you're pretty deep in this particular target." So that just kind of stayed by. But for a long time, I did that, and I had people call me, and I found some stuff for a few people here and there, you know. And I, of course, I can't disclose who they are and right. anything like that, but. Uh, I wouldn't mind finding something that was lawful that I could take myself, and I'm not kidding at all. I would really be nice. Something on private property, something you got permission on, and yeah. Or... You know, I, 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 when I was learning how to do this, I took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trips testing things, doing blind tests, so I could develop my system. Because unless you can be tested, right, and blind tested, you don't really know. You're just a dreamer. You know. There's even a mine over by Elko that I tested. And there was a little bit of information on it, on the, uh, you know, years ago. And it was a vein that run for several miles. And it was owned by this big mining company. And it was, I mean, really, if you calculate the value there, you're talking about not billions. You're actually talking about trillions of dollars. There's quite a bit of gold there. And it went right underneath this small town. And so the mining company had paid, bought everybody's houses, paid everybody's mortgages off, and then built them a new village. Hmm. a mile away and then after they did that they found out the vein went clear to that village so they had to work again wow but anyway i did just for my own knowledge and understanding on how the readings work i did a blind test on that one and marked the vein in every place and i hit it right on the money right to the edge everything that they had there and the depth i was about 95 percent accurate on the depth so when i developed this system there was there was no fantasy involved whatsoever. I demanded absolute results and absolute proof and absolute documentation. And when I started out, I, I missed about half of the targets. And now you've got to where you're And then I got better and better and better. Finally, one time when I was about 80% accurate, I, I missed a few more targets, and then I went ahead and found them afterwards. But 
it was kind of painful, you know, you go on, you work that hard for that long, for that many years, and then you fail and you miss a target, and you've traveled a thousand miles or whatever, and you go, oh no, but I paid the price. It was, it was, right. it was painful, it was expensive. Right. But, uh, I'm at a situation right now, I can find stuff pretty much. So, so if I, uh, if I throw your email address onto this video, would you be willing to to talk to people if they, you know, have sure, wanted sure. you to? Sure, sure. One thing I want to mention: I'm not going to deal with anybody if I'm going to do a job for somebody. I'm not going to deal with anybody that doesn't put the money up front. Mm -hmm. And another yep, thing that's, too, that's only I've fair. had four different people. That's only fair. And one yeah. of them lives locally, uh -huh. but I found a target for it. They kept it and didn't give me anything. Yeah, there has to be. Some protection for my partner. Yes. I, yes. I just about just said I'll never do it again. Yep. Because I don't when it you. comes to bounty and it comes to that much resources, people have some, their feelings change. Yep. And they're, they're tested, and most of them don't pass the test, I'm telling you. Yep. So uh, one lady, was, uh, I'm going to mention her name, she had some, her father died and left her some stuff, and she had no clue where it was at. It was basically gold and silver, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth. And, so I told her, I said, well, I'll do it, but you better, uh, if I were you, I wouldn't talk to your siblings about this. I you know, was in the house where she lived, and she owned the house. And she said, uh, oh, I, I did the detection work, and then uh, I found out later that one of her siblings found it and split, and he was a druggie. Oh. Uh. But, you know, this, is, this, this arena of detection stuff isn't fun. Oh, I mean, no. Yeah. I will do it for pay, or even on a consignment, or pay and a consignment. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. But, but, well, your time's valuable. Yeah. But another thing I won't do, and, and I've had people pull this on me, is I said, oh, yeah, I know where a treasure is. It's uh, whatever, 500 pounds of AU-197. And, and it says, I'll, if, he says, if you'll fly, one, let's go. One guy, I'll tell you about this guy. He's back, back in the south, and he says, it's about 1,500 pounds. I says, I says, all right, what will you give me if I find that for you? He says, my golly, Robert, he says, if y'all find that for me, I'll give you $50,000. I said, you'll give me $50,000 for, for finding you $30 million with the gold house suite. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do. If I find that for you, I'm taking half where it's no deal. Yeah. Well, I'll find it myself. And I said, yeah, you and the guy before you and the guy before that and the guy before that back since the Civil War. Good luck. <laughs> so that's just my feelings. I, was, I yeah. don't want any tire thoppers in. Yep. Uh, they have preconceived notions that I'm going to go out there and be their servant and be right. their little puppy dog. I'll right. do that. Yep. Anyway, yep. Uh, I've got a lot of experience dealing with people. Even when I worked at the refinery, a lot of people came in with gold deals. And, and I'll tell you one thing about gold deals. It's some of the most corrupt places that you'll ever find on the planet Earth. Uh -huh. There's all kinds of deals and there's all kinds of scams. And I tell you what, I'm on to all of them, so don't try to trick me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one guy came down from Canada, he's a nice guy, and he wanted to buy a mine. He was a mining company, a small time, and, and I, I gave him some counsel and they didn't listen to me. So he went on to this mine and he looked at their assays and they looked so good he bought it for $13 million. Uh. Those assays were all fake. Oh, terrible. If you look at a mine, you better do your own assays. Yeah. You better do your own core drilling. Yeah. And my brother John, he was a very good refiner. And the guy came to him, and they bought him a ton of dirt, and it was rich. Then another ton, and another ton, and another ton. And the only one that knew it was fake was the guy that was doing it. And all the people that worked for him for the same company, they didn't even know it was fake. He had salted the, huh. the ore. So John borrowed, my brother John borrowed a half a million dollars from the bank based on those assays and right. other assays. And uh, fortunately, he didn't put up any of his personal assets. Then John, John discovered it was a scam. Uh. So I say, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty skeptical. I'm yep. a careful person, but I'll be yeah. glad to. I'm open for somebody that wants me to help them find something. Uh, if it's straight overboard and if it's clean and clear. And, uh, and for now, I might want some kind of leverage, so if they, right. they can't just take it and run. Yep. So. <laughs> All right, Terry, anything else? <laughs> I think uh, that's probably a wrap.